for All right, well, welcome. Um, I'm Nick Gowing, sitting in London, and what we're going to do to analyze for the next 45 minutes, India and the global economic outlook. Welcome to this session. I know there's an extraordinary um, pressure and richness of discussions right through the day, and congratulations to Frank Richter for pulling us all together in this way. I have four guests, and what I'm going to do is introduce them in a moment, each of them one at a time, to hear what they're doing, to hear what their economic focus is, their financial focus, their business focus is. But to remind you, this is about the economic outlook. Um, there are so many pressures at the moment, the trade pressures, the joint failure of supply and demand, and of course, everything to do with uh, COVID-19, as well as what's happening in the oil sector, the retail sector, so many sectors. And we've got 44 minutes in which to analyze all of this at a time when the uh, pressure is on in, in, in incredible ways on the Indian economy, particularly on <coughs> consumer demand, and in so many areas, a real headache now for Prime Minister Narendra Modi. So let me introduce uh, all our guests one by one. Dinesh Damija is chairman of the Copper Beach Group. He's joining me from just southwest of London, coincidentally. Uh, what are you doing at the moment, Dinesh? Well, I'm um, trying to raise 150 million euros to set up a 227 megawatt solar farm in Romania. And what else are you doing in your business? What are well, no, 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 developing no. e-bookers? Yes, I, I, I did found and develop e-bookers and uh, had a nice exit. And uh, that was in 2005. Then I went into charity for 10 years and then um, uh, five years in politics, and I became a member of the European Parliament. Now, uh, I have uh, two large, three large charities in India. We give uh, 120,000 people free medicine, just outside Delhi, uh, through 15 clinics, and we give uh, 1,100 kids free schooling, and we've been doing this for 17 years now. Um, the third charity is a temple charity, uh, and uh, a lot of people don't think much of uh, uh, religious places, but they do give mental peace and mental, uh, the mind needs to rest and, and, and get solace, etc. That's why I do that. Good. Thank you, Dinesh. Let's now go to Washington, where, where it's uh, very early in the morning, even before sunrise, to Ron Summers. And I'm coming to you next. Ron, because you're founder and chief executive of the India First Group, but you've had a remarkable series of days in your relationship with India. It's been quite extraordinary this last uh, 70 days on, on COVID-19. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be supporting Gilead Sciences in their, in their bringing Remdesivir to India, to seven Indian companies that are now manufacturing Remdesivir for COVID-19 treatment, antiviral treatment of, Remdes uh, of COVID-19 um, for not only India, but for 126 other countries. And as I mentioned, India is playing an extraordinary role. They've cleared the regulatory pathway. Seven Indian companies are now able to manufacture Remdesivir in India for all of India and 126 other countries. It's been really quite an illuminating experience these last 70 days. And what have you discovered about the speed of uh, Indian bureaucracy faced with an enormous challenge like this? I, I have to c commend them. They've been extraordinarily coordinated. Uh, they started at the top with introductions <clears throat> between companies and, and the government uh, and wanting to facilitate. And they have expedited the regulatory pathway uh, two weeks in the case of uh, Gilead Sciences gaining marketing approval. And then just this weekend, uh, two other companies, Cipla and Hetero, are now bringing the drug to the country. That's record time in any stand from any measure. That's some few days. Ron, thank you. Let's now go to Pune, uh, to Rajan Navani, who's vice chairman of the Jetline Group of Companies. What is your focus at the moment? So thanks. Thanks, Nick. So, well, I come from a third generation, 80 year old uh, traditional family business that has been in packaging and textiles in Southeast Asia and India. But the last decade, we've been building out new age digital businesses, which would cater to 1.3 billion Indians' digital needs, and of course, taking that global as well. So we've been out there, uh, you know, at the forefront of digital, uh, both in India and around the world. And, you know, around the COVID period, while a lot of our traditional manufacturing businesses have had some of their own sets of challenges, but in the areas of 
you know, gaming and, you know, video entertainment and esports and all of those new areas, we've seen a, a big surge in, in a lot of our consumption, a lot of our platforms. Uh, also, we've been building a lot around remote learning, you know, and, and many significant areas where there have been drastic shifts. And we believe this whole contactless experiences uh, space is, is one area where a lot of our focus has been on right now uh, to see how you know significant changes can happen there. But uh, on the other side, you know, uh, of course, seeing how we could do our bit across uh, all the other aspects where you know a lot of our workers who have been affected, and and now the key uh, you know thing is how do we bring people back to work? Uh, how do we make you know everything work out uh, back to where it was? Uh, you know, even just pre-COVID before we, we move on further. So back that's to where it was, that, that's an important issue of principle. Will it ever get back to where it was? Let's pick that up in the discussion. Let's now finally go to TV Narendran, uh, who's joining us from Mumbai, who's the um, chief executive and managing director of Tata Steel and also the president designate of the CII. TV, um, give us more about the challenges for your business at the moment. Well, the steel business is uh, very closely linked to the macroeconomic activity, and to that extent, we are significantly impacted uh, by the pandemic. And we have a big footprint in Europe, we have a big footprint in India, and we have a footprint in Southeast Asia. So we are impacted across these geographies. We were in the middle of the structural and cultural transformation of companies that make it like that much complicated. But I think uh, we are a 110 year old company, so we have resilience to deal with it. And I think that's uh, happening as well as it's an option for us. Thanks, TV. Your, your signal is not great at the moment. Just be aware of that if you can. Let me now uh, ask for each of you to give uh, an overview of where you think, can we be sure of the way um, the world economy is going now? After three to four months of the COVID-19 catastrophe, the sinister nature of it, are there clear signals which can be relied upon by politicians and business uh, on the way things are likely to move now for their planning schedules and their planning outlook. Let me first go to Ron in Washington. What are you seeing as you're seeing it from both DC, from the United States, from North America, but also way across into South Asia? I believe it's still very early to be able to make any predictions on how this really plays out and allow me to to, uh, to just enunciate that a little bit. And that is that uh, when you think about 30 to 40 million Americans being unemployed by this crisis, and that's just the tip of the iceberg when you look around the globe, I just don't see how you can have that many people unemployed uh, and not have some material effect on the global economy. Uh, and, and this is going to play out for how long? Uh, it's like we just had this extraordinary a horrific earthquake. We've all survived the first shock. Uh, and But we don't know whether the building is broken, whether we have a foundational crack in the, in the, in the structure. Uh, and, and therefore, we don't even know what may happen next. Um, and then I wonder if we're going to have any aftershocks. I mean, are we going to have any resurgence of the virus that sends us back into our lockdowns, respectively? So I think it's still very early to know how this plays out, but I don't know how you can have this kind of a 70-day shutdown of the global economy and not have a material impact on the, on the overall global growth of the economy. So what's your advice to leaders, corporate leaders and political leaders, about how they have to grip this and give confidence of some kind? Well, to me, this is where you got to be very concerned about how everybody's going to behave and react. I mean, the, 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 the instinct is going to be to look inward. We should resist that instinct. We should try to be building our friendships and alliances as, as we've been building them. Uh, clearly, the, the bullies and the bad guys are going to try to take advantage of the crisis and act that out. And we're seeing that around the world in various ways. Uh, I think the Chinese border challenge right now in India is a very good example of that. Uh, and my hope would be that, that countries begin to work together in collaborative efforts. Uh, we've just seen that extraordinary effort with India and the United States on COVID-19 with Remdesivir. And, and I'm hoping that this is an opportunity for alliances to actually build European as well as American alliances with India. Thanks for the moment, Ron. Dinesh, what's your analysis? 
Well, uh, Nick, I, I, I'll just start off with a quote from Lenin. Uh, and he said, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. And these last few weeks have been the, like, as of decades have gone through. Uh, uh, and the question, I guess, for the government and for everyone is saving lives versus livelihoods and liquidity versus insolvency. So uh, we've got to make sure that the resultant unemployment um, does not convert to hunger, especially in India. I mean, Senator Sam Nunn of the US in, said in one of the Zoom calls that I attended, uh, in May, there were 44 million people unemployed and 30 million had lost their medical insurance. And that's uh, something that Ron just touched on as well. And the industries most affected are service businesses, not industrial businesses as such. Of course, they're affected too. Uh, and we're talking about restaurants, hotels, fitness clubs, sports stadiums, but also airlines, cruises, travel agents, red light workers, etc. Uh, and the problem is availability of money in India. I mean, India is 138th in, in the world on per capita income. And that's a figure according to Manish Sabarwal, who is a board member of the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. So we cannot expect a res response to COVID-19 from the Indian government commensurate to developed countries. So uh, the problems you've just mentioned, Nick, uh, dispute with China, COVID-19, climate change, well, everyone's seen uh, uh, from about 200 miles now, you can see the Himalayas in India. You couldn't have seen those before. Uh, so everyone's saying, hang on, we want this. So uh, as far as solutions go, I I've thought of a couple. Uh, as India's population is 65% under the age of 35 and not vulnerable as much to COVID-19, anyone under 55 should be out working. They should not be under lockdown because we need the economy to function, uh, taxes to be paid, etc. And this crisis should be used to reform, as you pointed out, Nick, uh, and Ron, the, the bureaucracy infrastructure down to state level, the judiciary uh, and foreign investment, uh, where, where foreign investment has been stifled. We need a lot more foreign investment in India. So uh, as the saying goes, always make use of a good crisis. To uh, quote Lenin again, Rajan, go back from Pune, please. Yeah, so, you know, I think while I'm sitting in Pune, you know, this crisis is probably like 9-11 hitting every country at the same time. You know, and I think the, the severity of the, of the whole challenge has been uh, that, you know, while, you know, different areas and different uh, governments are addressing issues relevant to their local population, you know, a lot of our businesses and pretty much around the world are are intensely connected across global supply chains and things like that, right? So I think the challenge that I really see uh, coming out of this is is how would you know things really return back to normal? What I was mentioning earlier. Uh, what if, is normal, Rajan? What is normal these days? Is that the right word to use? Right, right. So the right word to use was what was normal was what was pre-COVID. So I think the 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 first step, you know, that would take people back there is is definitely, you know, of course, being able to eliminate fear in people when they want to come back to work, uh, because I think that's a big challenge around the world. Uh, we are seeing that, and particularly in Pune, you know, we're, we're coming out of a lockdown, uh, and just the last weekend, uh, we probably had the highest number of positive cases uh, in the city. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, really, to see how how things would actually, you know, come back to where it was. So assuming we are saying the new normal is something different, um, you know, the only thing that I can say is that, you know, it's the same thing like what Dinesh was saying. It's, it's necessity is, is always been the mother of invention. We have to find new ways and do things differently to make that happen. And I think here, you know, government's incentives, uh, the support that they are able to provide is a very, very strong uh, factor that comes in because the countries are are all looking, you know, to someone or to something who, who who they feel have figured it out, right? And while we know that 
it's 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 a tremendous time of uncertainty we can only look, look back and say that yes these decisions were made you know then and they were right or wrong so i think a uh, direction is what really businesses people need i think inter country uh, within within different you know continents how do uh, countries start to come back uh, to normal i think that's that's a big part and at the end of the day i think the vaccine or a cure or something that gives people hope um, would definitely you know be a, a positive trigger and you know at the end of the day it's about every participative citizen uh, kind of coming to the forefront so it is it is a global crisis it is a it is a calamity it's a national calamity it's a local city calamity but the only way one can really come back uh, in a v or a u shape you know because i think that's what the session said and I, i believe it will be more a u shaped kind of a thing uh, you know curve coming back but uh, it will need a lot of things to fall into place to make that happen. ron and dinesh i'll come to you in a moment i'd like to know what what kind of shape you think it'll be and maybe tv you can give me your view as well of whether we can yet say what kind of shape some kind of recovery will be what's your view i mean you after all are in a critical industry for india and in other parts of the world as well but it's a heavy industry which is not easy to justify in the long term in this new challenge on sustainability yeah so i believe next year things will bounce back in india but having said that we are only TV, going to be where we were last year we you know, so here, if you look at the kind of keep going one more time okay. and i'm going to try and come uh, back to you but i'm afraid we lost the signal well, we're seeing you but not hearing you mute maybe can you hear tv up yeah. right we have bandwidth problems i think we can see you and we can hear you just about it's clipping so can i stand by one moment and i'll let come me, back to let you let me try and come back let again stay with us yeah. and i'll try again in a moment we're not hearing you i'm afraid tv stand by can you but let me go to ron and dinesh can we yet say what kind of shape this will be or is that simply too rash are we just shooting the breeze in a breeze which we don't even understand at the moment ron you know, my colleagues and nick i i want it to be a, a v i want it to be a rocket launch just like donald trump continues to call it uh but we remember 2008 so well and uh and man that took 10 years to climb out of uh, i'm very worried that we're headed for a slow climb here and therefore i would say it's going to look more like an l transformation uh it's going to be tough this is the biggest shock the globe has ever ever faced collectively and dinesh well, nick i can't understand um how um the, the stock markets are just going through the roof uh comparatively uh, is not because there's a lot of cash around so well, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if cash would go into into shares when you got unemployment so it's, it's, there's a big difference between wall street and main street as they say and i mean i can't i totally understand that uh, uh stocks from the s&p 500 drop out that are not doing well uh, uh, every quarter and and go in that are doing well and that pushes up the s&p 500 perhaps or any of the stock markets for that matter but um to go back to your question it is um i would just go with the signs the signs i i referred to this uh, in my in my 2 minutes says people over 60 or 65 are more vulnerable well they should be under lockdown yeah more more than others they're also not normally working or they can work from home through zoom etc i I must we must get the younger people to go out and earn they are can do a lot more at work now people in in, in the west have said okay mondays wednesdays fridays and we have the working population in a company well i'm not sure about that i think we should be going uh, i'm trying to get out of this um uh productivity gap that we just established so all government should be on to this on an age basis i should tell you i've had a, a note here from benjamin who was in a, on an earlier panel about leadership agreeing with ron that the crisis has just begun i've been forecasting a highly disruptive period for the world 20 to 25 maybe longer but the tumultuous 20s will also be a great opportunity as dinesh has just said 
Uh, TV, can I come back to you? And I hope there's a chance of hearing you this time. Um, do not if you can hear me, but you look like you're frozen. Can you try again? Uh, let me ask you for your two minutes of assessment of the global economy and how it's going to impact particularly you at Tata Steel. Are you still there? Yes. Try again, TV. Uh, Dick, I think I went off again. I'm sorry. Something's really bad. Can you hear me? TV, I'm afraid we're not having much success. We can't understand you at all. Um, so if you could ask the, your colleagues at Tata Steel, that would be very helpful. Let me move on as time is of the essence here. Let me, you're, you're, some of you are using the word normal, but is this assumption of that something like normal will return actually now a really distorting assumption for the realities that you all face, the world faces, that the economies face, that there'll still be money, that work will still be the same kind of work. What's your view, Rajesh? Rajan, sorry. Yeah. So, so, so to me, I think uh, the you know the normal will be a new normal for sure. And you know uh, when we look at you know many things uh, in the way uh, you know consumers consume things, uh, the way we we work, the way we just think about life. I think there's been a tremendous period of introspection uh, for people you know who have been back at home, so spend time with family, the ones who have been pained and affected will view it differently. So, you know, I think the fact that the same crisis has hit different cultures, different countries around the world will result in, in very different uh, reactions to that. While there will be certain things that will be, you know, very clearly common, like as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the whole world of contactless experiences just goes so many different opportunities out there where things will be different. Uh, so my view is that the normal will be new. It will be different. Uh, you know, things might, some of the things might take a much longer time to come back, uh, but there are other new ways, new opportunities. Just look at what we are doing right now, right? Someone yeah. like didn't cancel this event. He still went ahead and did it. You know, maybe this one year won't be the way it was. Veracis might not. But as a matter of fact, I think there are a lot more speakers, a lot more people engaged and doing things differently. So I see these kinds of things happening led by those people in those sectors, in those industries, you know. And I think it's important that governments also innovate, you know, and, and governments really play their role in ensuring there's demand, demand creation, you know, ensuring that businesses go through and survive this phase. Now, whether it's a three month, six month, nine month phase, we don't know. But I think it's the entire stakeholder uh, of, you know, of society that needs to really come together to make this, uh, uh, you know, happen. And I think we've always seen when when a human race is pushed against odds, you know, the, the best emerge out there. And, I, and I'm very hopeful and optimistic that, yes, it, it, it will take time, but we'll see green shoots and, and sometime at some point that momentum will pick up. All right, well, let me try TV once again, if I may, TV back in Mumbai. Could you try and uh, once more to give us your two minutes from the beginning? Can you hear me? I think you should continue without me. I think it doesn't make sense. I'm afraid we're struggling. Uh, am I the only person struggling? Dinesh, are you having difficulty hearing TV? No, I'm having difficulty. Switch off your video. We might be able to hear you. Yeah, switch off your video. Just switch off your video, can you, TV, uh, so that we can hear you in audio. Okay. Yeah. We'll be patient. We're still seeing you, but um, are you able to do that quickly? And I'll come back to you in a moment. If you could switch off your, your video, then I'll come back to you and, and try once more. Um, let me ask you, I'm picking up what um, Rajan has just said, and there has been another session on leadership, but but Ron and Dinesh, do you believe that the, the current political leaderships around the world of all political persuasions actually have the ability to, to grip the enormity of what is happening, the enormity of the expectations on governments and the ability to deliver, or do we have to face the fact that actually they are beyond their comfort zone and are really struggling at the moment, Dinesh. Well, Nick, I, I think that everyone's beyond their comfort zone. I don't, I don't think the leadership is bad. 
around the world. I think that they're doing their best. Um, they've been doing their best since they got elected, I'm sure. Um, some people might not, not like what they do, but, but you know, it depends on the political persuasion. But when it comes to this, I think that they're, they're doing their best. But I'm, I know for sure that the new normal is going to be a lot more unemployment in, initially. Yes. There is no doubt about it that, that people, uh, firms have been um, working without half their staff and most of their staff but, uh, are doing quite okay. So, so as far as I can see, that we are going to have um, whatever unemployment figures there are officially, they'll double straight away. We also need uh, to know that these people who are going to become redundant have to retrain themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, the good thing of this of this crisis is that there is there's a lot of time to say. I'm getting an echo. We're hearing you fine, Dine. Yeah, okay. There's a lot of time saved uh, because of less commuting and less travel. And that is a plus because we can be productive during that time. And that's important. I've seen in, in most of the events that I've attended or that I've been organizing, uh, events are having higher, uh, a higher time because people can make them when before they couldn't make them. So those are my two or three things that I want to add. And then Ron, what do you think about the political class? Obviously you have some particularly interesting challenges in the United States, but based on what you've seen in India in the past 70 days, what, what is your feeling about adaptability and nimbleness and agility in the political class to handle this? Because as we've just heard from Dinesh and, and Rajan, essentially, if people need money, they've got to have work. And if there's not enough work, that's going to be a massive problem because many people are simply not going to be even having enough money to pay for the basics they need, like food and energy. I mean, imagine being a politician in this environment. You cannot have this kind of an impact on an economy without some kind of a political impact. And therefore, those politicians that, that are able to be nimble and agile are going to be able to survive and, and lead. Uh, I just want to bring a, a, a kind of a comparison to pre-lapsarian and post-lapsarian comparison here. I mean, those are words that we don't normally use, but that goes all the way back to uh, Milton and, and when, when Adam and Eve ate the apple. I mean, this is a new loss of innocence before eating of the apple and after the eating of the apple. Uh, this is really changing the world now. And, 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 and I, I, my worry is that we don't evolve and devolve into a lost generation as we did after World War I. I mean, that is really the concern. I, Dinesh, I, I, I agree with you completely that we've got to be very uh, focused on employment and how do we grow the economy and put people back to work. And certainly we need to get the young generation engaged into the economy. Um, in terms of the agility of, of the government's functioning in this environment, I, I go to the optimism that we heard from Rajan. Uh, I have never seen uh, governments operate so efficiently as we just have uh, regarding COVID-19 and, and calls from government of India at the most senior levels, at the scientific levels, calling Gilead Sciences, asking them if there's any chance that remdesivir could come to India. That would have been in the March 30 timeframe. And here we are now just two months later and it's being manufactured in the country for all of India and for 126 other countries, and regulatory approval has been issued. That is an extraordinary speed of light under any measure. Uh, and that is the kind of agility that we're going to need to be seeing now around the world to cope with this crisis. TV, can I just check? Are you there or not? I can't see you at the moment. I'm anxious that you haven't really been heard properly. Speak if you, you were able to, even with your camera switched off. Are you able to hear me and speak? Not at the moment. What about the societal impact of this, though? It's all very well talking about an economy, but an economy is a product of society where people have money to spend. All three of you, how much are you concerned that essentially there's going to be a massive deceleration of economic activity? We know what the prospects are in India from the kind of official figures that are, are, are circulating now about the, the simple basics of people need to have money in order to spend to be effective consumers. Is that going to be a massive drag 
on economic activity and some kind of economic recovery. What do you think, Dinesh? Sorry, I just <laughs> muted myself. Okay. Um, I, I think that we're going to, to have a sock and see approach. Sometimes things are going to work. Sometimes they're not going to work. I, th I agree with Ron on the on the L. Uh, it's going to we're going to be taking out great figures uh, and 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 using the press and everything else to show we're doing very well. But actually, uh, the underlying state is not good. So uh, I, as far I don't know if I've answered your question, Nick, but I, I just feel that uh, politicians are are, to, are there for a hiding to nothing. Rajan, what do you think about this, particularly the fact that, particularly in your areas of, of consumer demand, there actually may not be people who've got cash to even buy what you're producing, and that in its own way is going to be a massive challenge to your survival or survival of companies like yours? No, I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I think, uh, you know, this whole COVID crisis has not exposed, you know, the inequalities in in affordability and income around the world, you know, like it, it needed a COVID to really highlight that and bring that to the forefront. And in countries like India, we've seen, you know, daily wage earners, migrant workers go back home thinking that they're not going to have a future for a long time in the cities, you know, and I, and I think the only way to really get that whole thing started is by, you know, accelerating uh, demand and and I think there are there are two or three things that have happened. One is uh, you know with people being in lockdown and indoors, uh, they they realized uh, many people realized that the need things that they needed to spend on uh, anyway were very limited, right? Uh, and and I think that that also got highlighted with, in many many instances. Uh, the second thing is what people were spending on was very different, you know. So you saw people stocking up on on food, on groceries, on the basic necessities of life. Uh, you know, which which have seen a tremendous acceleration, you know, in this period. Uh, the key is now, and therefore I felt that the there are only two ways that it can happen is really governments and businesses find ways to put money in the hands of consumers. Uh, and and what does it take? How does industry, government, regulators within countries and across countries really work to make that happen? Because I'm sure there will be some countries that will emerge uh, out of COVID sooner, uh, stronger. There will be others that will go weaker, you know, and, and will take a much longer time to recover because, you know, they were not able to, to deal with the health impact and the economic impact that COVID has caused. So I, I think it's going to need a lot of collaboration between stakeholders within countries, you know, across countries to make that happen. You know, we are on a CII event as well. And, you know, I've been chairing the India at 75 initiative, which is what Prime Minister Modi believes the new India of 2022. And CII has led that agenda for 15 out of the last, I mean, 13 out of the last 15 years. It started at India at 60. And I must tell you that throughout this period of these 13 years, we've seen issues and challenges that have, of course, you know, pinned livelihood as the core and building skills around which urbanization would happen, around which sustainability would happen. But now for the next two years, it's very clear the priorities are going to be very different. It's going to really have to deal with this economic inequality to just be able to bring back a social balance uh, in the country. And I think uh, how we address it from here on is really going to define uh, that for the next two years. At least. This huge societal um um, implosion, the hollowing out of society almost. I have to say, just so you know, that I'm watching to see if TV can come back from Tata Steel, but I haven't yet seen him reappear. So I'm not in any way easing him out. I'm just waiting to see if we can get a decent signal. But let, let me pick up on one specific issue in the last 10, beginning of the last 10 minutes, particularly about supply chains and globalization and therefore economic activity. How much are you assessing now that there has been an extraordinary change to what um, uh, one, I heard one senior government minister here in the United Kingdom talk about the discovery of this spaghetti bowl of supply chains. In other words, trying to unpick the enormity of the web that has been created in supply, supply chain. What's your view on that, Ron, about whether that's adaptable, given the pressures that there are now internationally? 
Well, there is definitely going to be a reshuffling of supply chain thinking uh, here in the United States, I'm sure, in every country around the world. I mean, everybody is now going to be reassessing uh, where was I before COVID and how did I ever get there? And my goodness, why did I get so dependent? And so global impact is going to be uh, a rethinking of our globalization strategy. I mean, my goodness, where we all were just five or six months ago, promoting this kind of global networking that we've all been part of and all have benefited by. Now it's going to be rethought by every country looking inward. And uh, how is that going to impact? I mean, I'm hoping it's going to make companies more efficient. I'm hoping companies are going to find their most productive ways to go. There's certainly going to be um, a new risk allocation process underway. I mean, companies now are going to be thinking about how do I uh, how do I uh, distribute my risk in ways where I don't get caught like I got caught at COVID? Uh, in, in that sense, we're going to become more efficient, and it's going to be a real opportunity for markets that have not been at the forefront till now. I mean, they are now going to be new leaders in, in supply chain opportunities. I'm hoping India is going to be one of those. India should be a great beneficiary of of this new rethinking that's now underway in the world. I mean, why are we sourcing everything from China when India is this extraordinary uh, talent pool where 54% of the country is under the age of 25? Maybe we should be betting on India rather than other countries in South Asia. Rajan, what's your view of that, and particularly on the supply chain issue, which uh, obviously is central to what you're doing in Jetline? No, I think I, I completely, you know, agree with what Ron said. I think the discussion that we are increasingly having now is is really how can India actually benefit? And you know, even we talk of stock markets either in the U.S. or even in India, you know, are 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 buoyed up because there is this fundamental underlying belief that a lot of a business that was being done with China, you know, an alternative to that is really India, you know, and also I think as the world is, is beginning to surface up how India can play a, a lot more, uh, can play a lot more, uh, you know, I would say it can become a lot more important in global supply chains than what it is today. And I think that jump is, is, is would be massive because if we look at the base at where India is today, you know, uh, compared to a China, I mean, the catch up is, is, is massive. So I think that's the optimism that's driving on the sentiment side. The challenge is on the ground, you know, Right from an, within the country, you know, uh, and I said, and that's that's the struggle. We don't know how long that's going to last. If we see India, it's divided into red zones, orange zones, and green zones, you know, and and you know, containment zones. So maybe there are certain plants that are in containment zones. They feed supply chains into other areas, and those are under lockdown. They prevent, you know, certain kind of things from being manufactured. Uh, of course, the ports and all of that has opened up. So I think on the global trade side. Uh, you know, things are slowly coming back to normal, but getting the act together uh, for a country like India to be able to, you know, I would say leverage that opportunity uh, might take time. And how long that will take, will will global partners and players be willing to wait uh, to, to see that happen are questions that are, are hitting us. And we've seen, uh, you know, we've begun to see where we are supplying to Europe and the US and in other countries, we are seeing increased demand in some of our areas. Uh, but again, you know, the challenge is to be able to deliver to some of that demand. And I think it's 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 the uncertainty that's 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 the worry. But over a medium and long term, I think uh, supply chains, uh, India's role in, in the global supply chain will definitely change. But of course, you've got to get to the medium and long term through the short term and the yeah. disturbance there, Dinesh. Uh, what do you see as the, the real conundrum now of the supply chain? about how companies, in order to survive this, providing they've got solvency, they need supplies, but then resourcing it at the same time as there being an extra cost in looking for yep. new supply chains. Right. No, thanks, Nick. Uh, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with Rajan on the need versus want uh, for consumers. But to answer Rajan on, on, on the spaghetti of, uh, of suppliers all over the world, well, I, I can't understand how one of our ministers is, thinks that uh, I didn't realize how bad it was and how many products come from outside. Well, we've been a, a European country and, and, and basically one country when it comes to manufacturing and not 
uh, the, the Europe as one country rather than the UK as one country. So, um, but India has a far greater chance of getting everything produced in house because it's got such diversity and it's so large. But uh, Rajan, try and, and I think I'm agreeing with you, try and come in from abroad to start a business in India. It is a nightmare. I mean, I've done it a few still. times. Yeah. So this needs to be sorted. You see, from the inside, you can turn around and say, it's so easy to start here. It's in here. Use guinea pigs from outside to see uh, what happens uh, to these people, what they want to bring foreign exchange in. All right. Now, I've uh, only got three, three minutes and 45 seconds left, each of you. Can I give you each no more than 45 seconds? And I'm going to be brutal about the role of governments here about the handouts, whether it's be helicopter money or, or, or whatever, the expectation that somehow everywhere the state is going to intervene quickly, Ron, in less than 45 seconds. Well, I'm going to use some of that up on, on uh, just, just giving a good example of where the pharmaceutical industry, Rajan, has been extraordinary in the sense that the first call that came out from the United States was to India. And, and the ask was, let us rely only on India. Can we make all the key starting materials all the API, all the active pharmaceutical ingredients within India? And the answer came back, yes, we have to do some rethinking. But in a week's time, the whole plan was in place. And now all the manufacturing for Remdesivir is in India. Now, that's quite an an extraordinary story. In terms of uh, intervention by governments and money being doled out, boy, I'd like to think it's a public-private partnership. If we don't now understand that that's uh, uh, the connectivity, uh, yes, we need the government to, to be providing the backstops. Yes, but I don't think we should just be recklessly printing money also. We need to keep our discipline. We need to grow our economies. We all understand our personal responsibilities in this. After all, in India, we just saw what demonetization okay. did to those people. My, my, my point is we can recover from this together. Rajan, in 30 seconds, that's all the time we've got left. And now I'll go finally to Dinesh. 30 seconds about the role of government in all this. Does it have to be very assertive, but with a, an incredibly high cost? in taxes and everything else quickly? I think so. I think so. I, I think around the world, uh, the only way to really, or the role that government, I mean, one of the key roles that the government needs to play is to is to spend right now. It is to, to put the money in the hands of the consumers. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, in India, one of the times when the largest consumer spend happens is Diwali, which is coming up in, in November this year. I, we've sent some recommendations that, Instead of, you know, companies, you know, an Amazon does a Diwali Mela or a Flipkart does or e-commerce companies and others do, the government should do, you know, a big Diwali right. incentive, put money into hands of people and make that change. Thank you. Yeah. Quickly, Dinesh. Uh, next, the, the U.S. have already given money. I think they sent out checks of $1,200, Ron, yep. to each person, yep. uh, which wasn't copied by other governments. And I think we should do that. I think we should do uh, I also think we should do uh, 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 Big business. Government. SMEs and individuals SME all have to share uh, uh, the burden of, uh, of the burden of, of the And the role of government quickly and in 15 the seconds. Government. The, role government, the role of government to role of government the conductor of office. Of, of the Thank you. Well, look, Dinesh Rajan, we've got 45 seconds left, and I need to apologize uh, to TV Narendra, but there clearly was a technical issue between uh, us and uh, somewhere in Mumbai, like South Australia headquarters. Can I thank you all very much indeed for sharing with us your thoughts as well? I think this is a massive amount to do in 45 seconds. And finally, can I just, I think on behalf of everyone, thank Frank Victor for the extraordinary achievement in bringing us all together in this virtual way, which is extraordinary. 300 of us all together, all on time. And uh, as we say in my business, which used to be broadcasting, uh, you are uh, hard in and hard out. And we're leaving you sadly at this point. Much more to discuss, but stay with this full day of sessions convened by Harassis. We much appreciate it. Thank you to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Very nice.